Grüezi and welcome to Opus 18 of Classical Kick, the podcast where we discuss topics relating to Viennese classical music and Austrian culture while enjoying a delicious cake. I'm your host, Daniel Adam Maltz. If you're new here, welcome. Click show more in the description below for more resources. Be sure to check out classicalcake.com. Haydn's fame spread across Europe, but as court composer to the Estrahazy family, he could rarely leave his remote post. When music-loving Prince Nicholas Esterhazy died, his son, Prince Anton Esterhazy, drastically reduced the responsibilities of his father's orchestra. So, 60-year-old Haydn was free to embark on the trip of a lifetime, a total of two years in London. My guest today is Dr. Dennis McAlden, conductor, musicologist, and director of the Haydn Society of Great Britain. Dr. McAlden, thank you for joining me. It's a pleasure. Normally, we enjoy a cake and coffee together while we record in person, but England just started another lockdown. When things are a bit more normal, we'll enjoy Eccles cakes together in person. Eccles cakes are small, flaky pies filled with currants. So, let's dig in. So, Johann Peter Salomon convinced Haydn to make the one-month journey to London. Who was he? Salomon was an emigre who worked in London as a, a violinist and entrepreneur. He ran a very successful orchestral series and he went pretty frequently uh, around Europe looking for talent for his performances. He knew that Haydn had been released from his contractual duties and so he, he uh, I believe the story says, he came to Haydn's house and said, I am Peter Solomon, tomorrow we will have an accord, which <laughs> is a meeting. Mm -hmm. And they did that. Yeah. And uh, so Solomon was German and spoke German. And so was, you know, perhaps more easily able to convince Haydn. Because Haydn was, you know, this is interesting. He was at the end of his life more or less. I mean, you know, I mean, he was at the end of his career, retirement age. I mean, we know he lived much longer, but he was an old man by all, by all standards of living. Indeed, he was. And it was typical of his marvelous uh, sort of outward looking enthusiasm. He was prepared to take this on. And as you remember, Mozart was very worried that he wouldn't uh, have a success in London because he didn't speak the language and he hadn't traveled as Mozart had. Yeah, yeah, that's the quote where you know, Mozart implored, you know, tells him, but you don't even speak English. And then that's I right. poetically says, but my my language, he was referring to music, is understood all around the world. Exactly so. So what was his reception upon arriving in London? Well, unlike Vienna and Austrian culture, which he'd known really uh, much more intimately, the newspapers were very powerful in Britain. The press was not under censorship as it was largely in the Austrian dynasty. And so the press had been banging drum for him. And Salomon had been part of that, making sure that the right kind of press releases got out. So even before he arrived in 1791, there was an awareness that this famous composer was coming to Britain. I see. And uh, yeah, because he was already famous the world over. I mean, he had built his reputation over the years. Yeah, primarily through chamber music, actually. Uh, so many things happened in that part of the latter half of the 18th century. We had uh, publishing became really effective and successful. There was lots of money to be made in publishing because it was the way in which domestic music making could get access to music that they could otherwise only hear in the concert hall. And so transcriptions of symphonies, and in Haydn's case, the quartets, did a great deal to um, uh, make him more popular and better known throughout Europe. Sure. So what was his social circle in London? Who did he, he see regularly? What was his day to day like? Well, he, he stayed with Salomon to start with. Uh, in, uh, I think, in Great Pulteney Street, um, where we put up a Haydn plaque uh, to uh, make sure that people in London know that he came to London. He complained enormously about the noise 
<laughs> because he had uh, a really heavy schedule with Salomon. Salomon wanted a symphony <laughs> every other week, more or less, or even more often than that. So uh, he had to get down to work, and yet he was hugely uh, important as a guest. He soon was really invited to in every kind of society, from the smart to the um, local pub, and one of his talents was his ability to get on with anyone, including the royal family, whom he wasn't at all phased by. Mm. And so I think he had a very wide circle very early on. Sure. And of course, the uh, royal family was from the House of Hanover, so they spoke German. Indeed, that was a plus, as it had been with Handel. Um, mm. In a way, there is a story to be told about, about the parallels between Handel's visits to London, which ended in him living here, and Haydn's, which ended in him nearly living here, being invited by the royal family, as, as you implied. I mean, you mentioned the social side of his life. I think the key thing, uh, which is a nice story in itself, is his um, uh, fondness for women. He was... <laughs> He was a, women were attracted to him, I think because he was such a, a natural, round, rounded personality. And he had a, a, a blob on his nose, which he thought made him ugly, but uh, the, no lady ever commented about this. And so uh, there is a nice story to be told about Haydn's London ladies. And my daughter, has put to, who's an who's opera singer, has put together a program which has done some of the concert halls in Britain called Haydn's London Ladies. And it really shows how much he drew on his female friendships. <laughs> he had a particular friend called Mrs. Schroeter, who was the, uh, uh, the wife of a, um, a court uh, musician, who um, died, and so she was the widow Schroeter. And there's a lot of correspondence between uh, the two of them when he was in London, which tell you so much mm -hmm. about the man and about his feelings for, uh, his sort of intimate feelings with a close uh, friend. What was concert life like in London at this time? Well, of course, he wasn't a virtuoso performer, unlike a lot of musicians in the 18th century who really were performers first and composers second because they wanted to write pieces for themselves. Haydn was basically uh, a rather modest fiddler and pianist. And so his concert life was uh, a nice combination which was very practical in the 18th century of the orchestra seated in a effective way so that Salomon, the leader, would stand up at the leader of the first violins. And uh, Haydn would sit at a 40 piano uh, with a, so they could see each other with eye contact. And the two of them would lead the orchestra through all the tr tricky corners and that sort of thing. And that was pretty successful. In those days, the, the piano was acting as a kind of continuo, just covering the corners and helping out, uh, especially when things went wrong. <laughs> It was used to rescue them. Yeah, I love I love playing uh, continuum and leading Haydn symphonies from the keyboard. It's a uh, it's a wonderful experience, especially I think for solo performers like pianists. I mean, you have your chamber music and everything else, but being in there in an orchestra is a joy. Yeah, and uh, London managed to have a uh, rather uh, robust and successful public concert life before other places in Europe. Indeed, it's the same part of that not being uh, the kind of seriously um, limiting, um, uh, I suppose it's a monarchy in, in um, Austria. I know it was an emperor, but, but it, the rules were all coming out of court. Whereas in Britain, there was considerable freedom because it was such a busy commercial place. So the middle class, as it were, uh, were wealthy enough to be able to afford that uh, subscription concerts. And that meant that although the aristocracy was still important in terms of patronage, that wasn't the whole story. The patronage was spread across several different classes of audience. Yeah. And where were his pieces performed? 
uh, at the Hanover Square Rooms, um, which is no longer there, um, but is uh, the Hanover Square is still there. How did his experiences and impressions of London, of concert life in London, everything that was new, shape his compositional style and output? Quite a lot. Uh, he is interesting. He kept a diary. No, the Hyde and, uh, Hyde and London notebooks are a marvelous source of things that he was impressed with, mm -hmm. like how much coal cost and that sort of thing, um, and. And so uh, I think the things that he picked up was making, the more he could make uh, dramatic and theatrical effects, and indeed comic effects in his symphonies, the more he would please his audience. Mm. And so he would uh, incorporate things like uh, folk tunes, which might be recognized. He certainly uh, was very uh, clear that dance music was a key part of what his audience w would like. And surprises. I mean, the whole joy of Haydn's late symphonies is that they can perhaps all be called the surprise, not just one of them. Yeah, sure. And so what pieces did Haydn write in London? Well, well particularly those uh, London symphonies, the ones in 90s and, and onwards so they've all nearly all got names like the military the drum roll um the surprise the clock and mm -hmm. as, as those names suggest each of those has a novelty in it he really knew the, the showbiz side and and i think thrived on it because it gave his uh, mind something new to fix on and then use his immense technique within the language of, of, of music. Mm -hmm. What I find a uh, interesting, um, what I find interesting that came out of the, his London compositions is this sort of idea of, of grandeur and everything seems bigger. You know, the orchestras are bigger. He's using full forces because mm -hmm. yeah, we know at Eszterházy, he was oftentimes working with just a few musicians, which is, you know, it's not that he was at a, a want for musicians. It's just a different type of ensemble. Indeed. And he had to learn to use that, uh, mm -hmm. interestingly, make a very good point. And it's wonderful to come to a piece which was not written in London, which is the creation, yeah. right, the great oratorio, which uh, we think the script was written for Handel. And when um, Haydn was leaving London for the second time, Salomon, his friend that we've mentioned so so much already, gave him this script as a as a sort of um, hint because he Haydn and he had gone to a a big Handel celebration of Messiah, and Haydn had been absolutely knocked out by the massive effects that, that the big performance of Messiah gives, which you you just mentioned, and in a way. All that he learnt in England from, because, sorry, let me just recap there. He went back to Vienna at the end of his London visits and then set to to write the creation. And all the um, skills and new colours he'd found in the big London orchestra are writ large in the uh, representation of chaos. Mm -hmm. I've written a paper about this in which um, I say that it's like um, uh, the, uh, the, the Wagnerian tone color, the Schoenbergian tone color principles, because almost every bar is a new instrumental color, and nobody ever done that before. Mm -hmm. So if you look at the first two pages of creation, you'll see the clever way in which he uses just a bar of each color to create this uncertainty of chaos. Uh, even the little so the double bass solo and things like that, which are very, very rare in 18th century music.
So it was at the end of his first trip to London that uh, Oxford decided to bestow upon him an honorary doctorate. What led to that decision? That was a nice story because um, there's a man called Dr. Burney who was instrumental in helping to look after him when he came over and Burney put him up for a, a doctorate and Oxford um, had already got quite a good reputation, of course. And so um, Bernie was his sponsor, if you like. If you want to ha get a, doc um, a doctorate yourself, sir, you'll have to get a sponsor, mm -hmm. unless you get it by hard work, which is probably how you're going to get it. <laughs> An honorary degree, you have to have a sponsor. Or, and so why did Haydn leave after one year? because he was given the hard word by the Esterhazy family. I see, so he was called back to the court. Yeah, just like Handel. Yeah, interesting. So Haydn went back to Austria for two years and then traveled back to London. What yes. prompted the second trip? Well, the second trip, I think, in a way, was uh, when the richest music came because of course, he learned a lot on the first trip, and so he knew how to cut corners and he, many of his old friendships uh, he, he could open up again. And uh, that's when, uh, again, various um, ladies helped him. There's a woman called Anne Hunter, who was a poetess, and she wrote quite a lot of um, text for him. And so I think the second visit was just uh, building on the little bits that he hadn't been able, the kinds of music he hadn't been able to explore the first time he was able to have a look at. Of course, he was commissioned to write an opera on the Orpheus legend, mm -hmm. which then wasn't, it wasn't possible to perform it. And he spent a lot of effort on that. Mm -hmm. So as you mentioned earlier, uh, at, towards in his second trip in 1794, King George invited Haydn to re remain indefinitely in London. That's right, too. Haydn gave a very, you know, uh, sort of, in my opinion, Haydn-esque reply, very typical for him, where he said that, you know, he was like an old tree, and if you took him out of the ground where he grew, then he would simply die. What yeah. do you think he meant by this? I think it's true. I mean, uh, I, I don't know how well you you feel it applies to other people. I, I think the thing about getting beyond 60, probably, is that people are often drawn to their roots. You notice very much if uh, a married couple, one of them dies, sadly, the other will often go back to the root, their own roots for comfort and a sense of safety. And I think that was strong in Haydn's case, particularly as it was the time of the Napoleonic Wars. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, the, the, the possibility of traveling uh, after 94 was very uncertain. So he thought if he didn't go then, he might never get back and never be able to uh, die in, in the land in which he was born. I think, I think he felt pretty sentimental about his homeland, which of course is a, a, a a theme that runs through most of our lives. Sure. Do you think that even though he enjoyed London immensely and was able to learn and, and take a lot of it into his own use, that he felt that his inner culture, his just being, was Austrian, you know? Because he kept his, his, even the music he wrote in London, even though it's a bigger scale, I mean, it's not an entirely different person. It's still Haydn. Oh, yes. Uh, I think it's... Uh, it would be surprising if it was any more different. And this is, of course, why your earlier, earlier points about going as, as a man of 60, by the time most of us are 60, we're pretty well set in our ways. Mm -hmm. and, we, and if we're writing music, we probably write it in that way and don't alter it very much. Um, I, I think it, it, it's probably true to say that uh, he uh, was also... Um, a, a bit nervous about the immense pressure he was under. The two visits he had in London, he, he does complain quite a lot about being overworked. And I think he sort of had a sense that 
he would never get any peace in, in London. People would be always dropping in, always saying, will you write me something for my daughter's wedding or something? <laughs> and he would just uh, not really have the rest that he felt um, by 1794 he truly earned. Haydn, quote, considered the days spent in England the happiest of his life. He was everywhere appreciated there. It opened a new world to him. Thanks, Dr. McAlden, for sharing this classical cake with me. Thank you very much indeed, Daniel. It's been a great pleasure. And thanks to you listeners for tuning in. If you learned something new, then please like and share with your friends. If you haven't already, please subscribe. I'm Daniel Adam Maltz. See you in Vienna. Auf Wiedersehen.